Well, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the organizers uh, uh, for uh, the invitation to come and uh, present to this group. So uh, I have uh, no financial or other conflicts of interest. I will acknowledge that uh, my primary source of income is related to doing kidney transplant. So I see everybody that loses their kidneys. Um, <clears throat> Management considerations with the small renal mass. And in this context, I'd like to refer mostly to the uh, uh, T1A, the ones that are less than four centimeters. I think we all recognize over the past 15 years, substantial amount of data related to the increase in the incidental findings of uh, the small renal mass. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, clinical T1s are now recognized to have a fairly heterogeneous uh, biologic uh, potential. Uh, several uh, sentinel papers, the one of Frank from 2003, really I was the first to identify how size predicts histology and grade. Uh, when you look uh, into his data, the one, one centimeter mass, 46% uh, were benign, um, <clears throat> and uh, associated with a smaller size was a shift in the relative preponderance of clear cell versus papillary, smaller tumors uh, being more papillary, which we understand as a uh, more indolent type of tumor. Uh, Noyen uh, and Dr. Gill published uh, uh, 2009 is, is the paper, um, where he looked at uh, uh, SEER data and uh, uh, the incidence of metachronous metastases at the time of presentation for masses less than of four centimeters was 5%. Associated uh, um, uh, with findings of the uh, increasing incidence of the small renal mass is a shift to an older population. Um, in the CRISPIN study, which is an active surveillance uh, a study, the average age was 71. And I'm gonna present some information on uh, this most recent publication uh, from the Journal of Endourology in just a moment. Um, finally, there's a treatment disconnect uh, identified by Hollingsworth and colleagues, 2006. Uh, <clears throat> increase in the incidence of uh, uh, renal cancer, there was a proportional increase in surgery, mainly in the uh, T1 tumors. Uh, however, what was noted is there was a, a fourfold increase in mortality, which uh, led to the conclusion that we may be over-treating the small renal mass. Uh, in other words, there uh, may be a situation where uh, great therapy for those who don't need it and none for those who do. This is a uh, recent publication for, uh, from the Clinical Research Office of the Endourologic Society uh, looking at the uh, current epidemiology of the small renal mass. It's a relative, it's a large series, multi-institutional, in, international. Uh, <clears throat> several of the important findings. Diagnosis is incidental in two-thirds of the patient, and the median age here is 62 years. Um, almost 50%, uh, 42% were clinical uh, uh, T1A. Um, average size, 44 millimeters. But the most important finding here is that comorbidities were significant in this population greater than two comorbidities in a third of patients, and CKD greater than stage three in almost a quarter of the patients. So what are we looking at here in terms of the treatment goals? Who should really get therapy, and who, who's gonna be a candidate for active surveillance? When the life expectancy is gonna be greater than the time to treatment benefit, then it's rational to perform an intervention to try and change the natural history to enhance the life expectancy. However, if life expectancy is, a, is less than the time to treatment benefit, then active surveillance certainly makes a lot of sense. I think the primarily challenges to us as clinicians are determining what really is life expectancy and what are the determinants of that? How are we gonna make that determination? And what, how are we gonna identify those renal masses for which the time to treatment benefit is gonna be reasonable in order to intervene. Uh, to that end, there's been a um, um, number of papers uh, looking at uh, a competing risk, and I'll just identify uh, 
this website created by the Fox Chase Group as a way to look at comparing how a patient is going, going to do uh, with um, active surveillance uh, versus uh, intervention. A more um, visual way to uh, identify this um, was uh, presented uh, in uh, one of the uh, Uzo papers. And on the top line, we have uh, all the T1A lesions. Second line here, T1B lesions. Uh, the third line here are T2 lesions. And with each increasing row, there's increasing Charlson morbidity, comorbidity. So when you look here, um, the blue indicates the relative proportion of patients who would uh, have a, a mortality re uh, related to competing risk. So you can see here, in most of the T1As, there is much more mortality that's going to be associated with competing risk compared to cancer-specific mortality. So th these are the types of data that um, uh, drive some of the discussion related to those patients who would benefit from active surveillance. So separating it, there are really two features. How do we assess the uh, heterogeneous or biopotential of the small renal mass, and then how do you assess the patient? So look, the mainstay is really gonna be the CT. We get from that cyst, solid, fat. Some data suggesting that the renal or complexity score actually uh, may relate to things like grade. I think most radiologists uh, would acknowledge that there's improved soft tissue characterization um, that's associated with this technique and that there are two techniques that are up and coming that really may benefit us. Diffusion weighted imaging, in some cases, this can be used without gadolinium, especially in those patients with uh, renal dysfunction where the use of gadolinium is a relative contraindication. Um, there's a relatively new technique, and if you've got five physicists that work with your radiologist, arterial spin labeling may help identify uh, histology. So these are two techniques that are up and coming that uh, may be uh, suitable and helpful in determining uh, candidacy for active surveillance. Renal biopsy, when it's going to make a difference, um, can be useful at, a, at the AUA. Uh, th there is a, a multi-institutional Canadian study suggesting that 90% of the uh, uh, renal biopsies <coughs> done in the setting of a small renal mass were informative, 88% identifying the histologic subtype, 67% identified the grade, and in those patients who ended up with surgery, where they could review a surgical uh, specimen, there was 100% concordance with the, with the biopsy and the surgical specimen. In terms of molecular pro profiling, they have very good techniques now uh, that are predictive for prostate cancer. This is the hope we would have also with the use of the renal biopsy. However, development of these um, is not uh, sophisticated enough for it to be uh, uh, of any clinical utility. So how do we assess the patient? Basically, what we want to do is identify competing risk for an ad adverse outcome, um, what we would refer to as a comorbidity burden. Typically, you want to assess uh, cardiovascular disease, since that's going to be the single most important source of mortality risk. Second in place, of course, would be uh, uh, renal disease, and there are many other considerations. I would just point out that in the domain that I uh, do routinely kidney transplantation, there's been uh, increasing attention in our literature related to assessing uh, frailty as a risk factor and sarcopenia or muscle loss. These are uh, concepts that are borrowed from the geriatric literature and uh, have, a, I think, a potential to be applied in this circumstance. Typically, what you like to identify is a standardized index or something that's repeatable uh, and predictable to really assess um, what, what, what the patient's life expectancy would be. Uh, <clears throat> in some studies, uh, the Charleston Comorbidity Index has been used. And I have an example here just to indicate. The example is a rather stark one. Um, 60 to 69 years old, previous MI, COPD, and diabetes, which may be typical of some of these patients that come in. Charleston score is seven, and when you correlate that with one-year survival and 10-year uh, survival, uh, you can see uh, some pretty stark results here. One-year survival, 
10-year survival, less than 20%. So what do we know about uh, natural history of the untreated uh, small renal mass? I've, uh, there are many, many studies. I've selected uh, um, three that I, th I think are uh, some of the most informative. Let's look first at the growth rate. The growth rate is um, fairly slow, 0.13 to 0.31 uh, centimeters per year. Now, a couple of things on the growth rate. Um, in the second paper by Jewett, we have one of the co-authors here sitting in the front row, Neil. Um, the growth rate of both malignant and benign tumors uh, was the same. They had a substantial number of oncocytomas, so that you're not necessarily going to be able to pick which is benign or malignant just on their growth rate. Um, I would also, um, uh, going down to the zero growth rate, there are about up to a quarter of the uh, renal masses that, uh, in most of these series, the follow-up is about 36 months, although the second paper, I believe, was five-year uh, uh, follow-up. Up to a quarter of the patients will have zero growth. The unique feature about the zero growth uh, renal masses, or they never went on to develop metastases. Interestingly enough, in the Jewett paper, 26% of the tumors actually regressed or actually got smaller on, on follow-up. So that's something, something to note. Um, in terms of uh, interventions, 15% um, uh, uh, in one of the studies, 45% uh, uh, in another. Uh, the development of metastasis in the meta-analysis published by uh, the Fox Chase group was extremely low, 2%. In the uh, paper number two, Jewett paper, there were two patients who developed metastatic disease, and it was unclear whether or not those were really synchronous or metachronous tumors. Uh, triggers for intervention, there really is no standardization. Um, typically, we think of this as something that's uh, elective. Maybe there was some um, morbidity initially at their presentation that's been corrected. Um, some have used doubling in either the linear growth or volume. Um, and some have defaulted back to the general rule of thumb that's associated with the VHL patients that when you get to three, th three centimeters or more, the risk of metastasis is high enough to justify an intervention. Regarding uh, surgery or ablation, well, we could probably have about an hour and a half uh, discussion on this. Suffice it to say that the five-year cancer-specific survival isn't going to be any different no matter what technique you use. The propensity for local recurrence is going to clearly be higher in the uh, thermal ablation group. Biggest concern with radical nephrectomy as above is going to be renal loss and the potential for uh, CKD. Partial nephrectomy, now done uh, robotically for the most part, re relatively uh, safe, um, small percentages of uh, leaks and bleeds. Um, in both of the thermal ablations, there can be difficulty in salvage uh, surgical treatment. Some of the most challenging circumstances I've seen surgically with uh, completion nephrectomy have been in patients who've undergone previous cryoablation. So to, to summarize just a bit, and then I'll have an algorithm, here are the arguments um, for and against um, active surveillance surgery ablation. Again, for active surveillance, no surgical morbidity, preservation of renal function, uh, no futility of therapy, if you will. There may be some evidence of cost effectiveness with this approach. Against it, of course, is the potential for progression. Um, the other consideration that I really don't see uh, drafted in some of these papers is uh, the concern about repeated radiation exposure. These patients generally are older, uh, more comorbid, so long-term radiation concerns I don't think are a big issue. Then again, there's certainly the anxiety without definitive treatment. In terms of, of uh, the surgical side, it is definitive treatment, it optimizes the prognosis, and in some cases may really alleviate the anxiety. Um, Again, the timeline for cure may be inconsistent with longevity and the, uh, the morbidity that's associated with the procedure. So I'll summarize with uh, an algorithm here. When the small renal mass is identified on the left, we have to identify prognostic variables that are intrinsic to the renal mass, and you can see them listed above, and then look at the prognostic issues related to patients, and then uh, simply stratify them uh, by risk. Um, uh, 
the Hopkins group has uh, drafted uh, what they call the delayed intervention and surveillance of a small renal mass uh, program where they've actually put some metrics to this. Uh, but just theoretically, uh, you know, clearly someone who's 45 years old, who's healthy, who has a two and a half center renal mass, this person is more than likely going to go on to some sort of an intervention. And then um, the person that I described with the Charlson comorbidity index is going to be such a poor risk candidate, there's going to be no question about active surveillance. There's going to be a substantial population that falls as the intermediate risk. For these patients, a biopsy may be helpful to further stratify risk, either into the low risk or high risk category, depending upon biopsy findings. And then these patients may then be able to go on to active surveillance if they meet criteria or triggers for intervention, um, growth greater than three or four centimeters in an intervention, and then the patients who have a high risk biopsy, even though they may be an intermittent risk patient, may go on directly to an intervention. So with that, I'll say thank you very much, and uh, again, appreciate the invitation.